Bridges are a vital part of our infrastructure, connecting communities and enabling the flow of goods and services. They allow us to traverse bodies of water, valleys, and other physical obstacles, and can be found in various forms all around the world. But building a bridge over deep water presents a unique set of challenges and requires careful planning and execution. In this video, we'll be exploring the various steps involved in constructing a bridge over deep water, using real-life examples to illustrate the process. So if you're interested in how these impressive structures are built, then keep watching. The first step in building a bridge over deep water is to conduct a site analysis to determine the best location for the bridge. This involves analyzing a variety of factors such as the width of the waterway, the depth of the water, the strength of the currents, and the soil condition. The chosen location should be able to support the weight of the bridge and be able to withstand the loads that it will be subjected to. It should also be easily accessible for construction purposes and be cost-effective to build. For example, when building the Confederation Bridge in Canada, engineers had to consider the fact that the bridge would need to span the distance of 12.9 kilometers, 8 miles, across the Northumberland Strait, with water depths ranging from 45 meters, 148 feet, to 60 meters, 197 feet. They also had to take into account the strong currents and winter ice conditions in the area. The chosen location needed to be able to withstand the forces of the water and ice, as well as the weight of the bridge and the loads it would be subjected to. Once the location has been determined, the next step is to design the bridge. This involves deciding on the type of bridge to be built, determining the size and shape of the bridge's components, and calculating the loads and stresses that the bridge will need to be able to withstand. There are many different types of bridges each with its own set of strengths and limitations. Some common types of bridges include beam bridges, arch bridges, suspension bridges, and cable-stayed bridges. The type of bridge chosen will depend on various factors, such as the span of the bridge, the terrain, the types of loads it will need to support, and the available materials and resources. For example, a beam bridge is a simple and cost-effective solution for shorter spans while a suspension bridge is better suited for longer spans over water. An arch bridge is well suited for spans over valleys, while a cable-stayed bridge is a good option for medium to long spans. Once the type of bridge has been chosen, the next step is to determine the size and shape of the bridge's components. This involves calculating the size of the beams, girders, cables, and other structural elements that make up the bridge. The size and shape of these components will depend on the loads that the bridge will need to support, as well as the material properties and manufacturing capabilities. For example, when building the Akashi Kaikyo Bridge in Japan, engineers chose to use a suspension bridge design, which is well suited for long spans over water. The bridge has a main span of 1,991 meters, 6,352 feet, making it the longest suspension bridge in the world at the time of its construction. Once the design is complete, the next step is to prepare the construction site. This may involve dredging the water to make it deeper, building temporary support structures, or installing pilings to provide a foundation for the bridge. Depending on the location and conditions, various methods may be used to create a stable foundation for the bridge. One common method is installing pilings, which are long, sturdy poles that are driven into the ground to provide a foundation for the bridge. Pilings can be made of various materials such as concrete, steel, or timber, and are typically driven into the ground using specialized equipment. The number and spacing of the pilings will depend on the size and weight of the bridge, as well as the soil conditions. Another method that may be used is dredging, which involves removing sediment and debris from the bottom of the waterway to create a deeper channel. Dredging may be necessary if the water is too shallow to allow the bridge to be built at the desired height, or if the water is too murky to see the bottom. Dredging can be done using specialized equipment such as dredgers, which are large vessels equipped with buckets or dredge pipes that can scoop up the sediment and remove it from the waterway. In some cases, temporary support structures may also be built to provide additional stability during the construction process. These structures can take various forms, such as towers or scaffolding, and are used to support the bridge as it's being built. They may be necessary if the bridge is being built in segments, or if the bridge is being built using a cantilever construction method, which involves building the bridge out from both sides of the waterway until they meet in the middle. For example, when building the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge, which spans a distance of 55 kilometers, 34 miles, across the Pearl River Delta, engineers had to dredge a shipping channel and install over 400 pilings to support the bridge. 
The pilings were driven into the seabed using specialized equipment, and the dredging was done using large dredgers that scooped up the sediment and removed it from the waterway. Once the construction site has been prepared, the next step is to start building the bridge. This may involve assembling prefabricated components on site or constructing the bridge in segments that are then lifted into place by cranes. The construction method used will depend on the type of bridge being built, the materials and resources available, and the logistics of the project. For example, when building the Oresund Bridge between Denmark and Sweden, the bridge was constructed in segments that were floated out to the site and lifted into place by cranes. The segments were prefabricated in a factory and then transported to the site by barge. Once they arrived at the site, they were lifted into place by cranes and welded together to form the completed bridge. Once the bridge is complete, it will need to be tested to ensure that it is safe and able to withstand the loads that it will be subjected to. This may involve subjecting the bridge to simulated stress tests or simply allowing vehicles to use the bridge for a period of time to see how it holds up. Finally, once the bridge has been deemed safe and ready for use, it can be officially opened to the public. And that brings us to the end of our discussion on how bridges are built over deep water. We hope you found this video informative and that you now have a better understanding of the various steps involved in this complex and impressive process. Thank you for watching and be sure to check out our other videos and subscribe to Civil Mentors.